right, everyone. Welcome to uh, our latest episode of the Salt Education Show. So uh, I am one of your co-hosts, Dr. Taylor Primer, along with Dr. Brett Winchester here. So uh, we're really excited. We have a, a guest, Stephen LaPlante. So Stephen LaPlante is a, a PT ATC. Uh, he is with the Andrews Institute uh, with the Children's Health and Orthopedics of Sports Medicine facility in uh, Plano, Texas. And so uh, we got a chance to, um, to, to take a look at this place uh, a couple of weeks ago when you're in Dallas. And uh, what a cool, amazing facility. So outdoor track, um, Exos training facility, uh, turf field, you name it, they basically got it. But uh, the reason that Steven is here right now is that uh, he has got some pretty amazing research when it comes to BFR, blood flow restriction therapy, uh, post ACL reconstruction surgery. And so uh, BFR is something that we have dabbled in. We're starting to get really heavy into at, at the clinic. Uh, we, we use the same, uh, same unit that Steven uses here. And so we want to know uh, basically what his research showed him. And then we're going to kind of get into the clinical aspects of uh, where we can apply BFR and what that kind of looks like. So uh, Steven, do you want to take us, take us through some of, your, uh, some of your research? Yeah, yeah. So as of right now, um, we haven't started data collection yet. We actually just submitted for IRB um, right at the beginning of the year. Um, just a little background, guys that are using BFR, you know, there's a ton of research out there, a lot of ACL research, but there's not a whole lot on the youth population. And uh, currently, there's only two studies that are being done right now. So there's one out of uh, Atlanta Children's, they're looking at ACL, but they're only looking at patellar tendon grafts. And then uh, Children's up in Connecticut is doing a uh, kind of like a retrospective, or maybe prospective, actually, a safety study. The Atlanta study, we kind of looked at what they did. And we wanted to include like the hamstring grafts too, right? So no one's looked at graft differentiation. Like no one's looked to see what's the difference between like a patellar tendon or a hamstring. And I hope eventually we'll do like a quad tendon um, autograft as well. Um, that's kind of becoming more popular specifically in the, the pediatric environment. But um, we're going to look at like a 12 week training course. So we're going to start them at two weeks with the BFR. We've got a protocol that half the patients are going to go through. And then we're going to look at some different metrics along the way, right? So we're going to look at size of the, uh, the quads, so the girth, for the quad, we're going to look at range of motion. We've got a ton of like subjective questionnaires. Uh, we're going to start isometric testing at like eight weeks, and we're going to carry that through till about four months, and then isokinetic testing after that. Uh, we've got drop jump assessment coming later on. So a lot of things that no one's looked at yet. So we have a ton of stuff that shows, yeah, we get quad girth, we get uh, isokinetic strength gains, but no one's looked at like from a functional pattern, like how does someone do with something like as complex as like a drop jump assessment? Um, we're very lucky to have a really nice lab. So we've got uh, a couple of force plate treadmills. So we'll get all that data from that. And we're gonna collect data for about a year. And then we're gonna kind of do some follow-up at two years just to kind of see how they're doing. Um, but pretty cool study. We're, we're pretty excited to get it running. Uh, and I think the guys, uh, all the BFR people that are kind of running those courses are pretty excited about it too. So you know, traditionally we know there's a lot of research on BFR regarding ACLs, but no one's done a ton right now uh, with the youth population. So currently, just to give you an update, there's only two studies that are currently underway with youth athletes, and one of them's out of uh, Children's Atlanta. So they're looking at ACL with bone patellar tendon bone autograph, um, and then there's a study out of Children's up in um, Connecticut, and they're doing like a safety study, which is, is something we need, and we've all kind of asked for that, uh, just to make sure that you know all these docs and all the parents feel comfortable that when we put a tourniquet on a kid's leg and make it turn purple, that you know we're not doing anything detrimental to that kid, right? Like it. You know, you got those parents and they walk over and they're like, whoa, like what's going on with my kid's leg? And you're like, ah, it's normal, man. Like he'll get over it. Um, In the back of your head, you're going, I think it's normal. <laughs> it is, you know, the, the, the purple leg with the white splotches, like, you know, that's kind of what we want to see. I mean, yeah. then you got the kid with like the agonizing face on because it just sucks. But, um, you know, so our study, uh, we, we kind of built off of the Atlanta group and we uh, included hamstring autographs because we got a lot of skeletally mature kids. So you're not going to do like a patellar tendon autograph on a skeletally mature kid. So we wanted to include that in our study. So that, that'll be kind of a differentiating wow. factor. And then um, also, you know, we're gonna start collecting uh, data as early as like two weeks. And we're gonna go all the way for about two years. Um, but most of the bread and butter is gonna be for the first 12 weeks. So we're gonna look at some different things like quad girth. We're gonna look at range of motion and a ton of like IKDC and COOS and uh, all kinds of subjective questionnaires. And then we're gonna talk about some isometric biodex stuff. And then later on, as we go through, we're gonna look at like drop jump assessment on uh, force plates. And so we're gonna get a ton of data that's never been collected yet. And we're gonna do it in the youth athlete population. So even in adults, like you don't see a lot of the data that we're collecting. So this will be probably one of the most thorough studies 
and being done in youth athletes, which is one of our primary populations for ACLs. Steven, do you think that uh, what you guys are doing, that we're going to be able to maybe push the limits on the time back on the field? Or do you think it's more that the quality is going to be better that, the, that way when they get back on the field, that the chance of re-injury is better? Because I think the data says that within the first year, there's a 10% chance of a re-tear no matter who does the surgery. Yeah. So what, what are you, uh, well, I guess, what is your, your selfish goal and what you guys are doing down at the Andrews Institute? Yeah, I mean, our big goal is to get those re-injuries. Like, I uh, wasn't really familiar with, like, re-tears when I was doing my early stuff. And now with kids, like, I'm seeing it. And you kind of start questioning, like, I'm, am I really good as a therapist and, and at rehab? And, and not just within our own system, but you read the research and you're like, man, we're not really good at return to sport. So I think my ultimate goal is to try to get these kids a little bit stronger before we start talking about that return to sport at 9 to 12 months. Right. Uh, I don't think there's any way to speed up, right? Physiological healing of the ACL it's important to understand that it doesn't really go faster. Now there's some stuff that's coming out. Uh, there's a good paper coming out, should be out this year, where they looked at um, like a DEXA scan on BFR. Um, and I can't remember the author of it, but they looked at it and they saw that actually like the bone got thicker too. So, right, we have this um, like an osteopenic kind of thing that happens to the femur when we don't use it. And so the BFR group in that study um, at about six weeks started to reverse that process, whereas the non-BFR group actually continued to show that that shrinking of the femur. So we know about thigh girth is going to be a result into that. Mm -hmm. But if you think about, too, what's happening at the bone, like if we use a, a, a bone patellar tendon bone graft, we've got these bone plugs, like I think it would solidify that a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But once again, I don't think it changes the ACL physiology. I think you still need to, I think timeline is still going to be the same. Um, but yeah, if we can be better about not getting these kids re-injured, I think it'd be pretty cool. And how early are you guys starting this BFR process? Like I know the Owens group is, is saying, you know, within the first couple of days, you can start doing hundred percent occlusion. You can start doing other things like that. Where, where kind of are you seeing this like uh, clinical application begin? And then is there an end point that you maybe stop using BFR and you move more sort of strength training or anything like that? Yeah, no, great question. Um, I just did a uh, journal club with uh, Johnny Owens Thursday and we talked a lot about this, but um, in our study, we're starting at two weeks just for consistency. Mm -hmm. Can you start it before then? Absolutely. But a couple of ground rules that I, that I use, like I don't want a really swollen, angry knee. Uh, if it's still kind of stiff and swollen and doesn't look like it you know, would respond well to that, I'm going to wait a little bit. Um, but most of our ACLs are starting it at two weeks. Um, I think you got to make sure that uh, all the sutures, everything's closed up, the incisions aren't leaking. Mm -hmm. I have had situations where we did it and you get a little ooziness out of that suture and you know, nobody likes that. Um, but yeah, I, I think you can start early. I have a couple of kids that all started at like second day out in the first week. Um, but they're kids that I know can tolerate it. Um, and then as far as how long do you use it, it's, it's patient specific too. So a good case that I have right now, I have a girl that uh, ACL, meniscus, and a little bit of cartilage wear and tear. So we're keeping her relatively unloaded um, for about 16 weeks. We're not going to do any like plyometrics or running, whereas most ACLs I would. So in that meantime, when she's in this kind of unloaded, I still want to use BFR. Like I'm not going to heavy load her compared to other ACLs because I don't want to irritate some of that tissue. She had a pretty complex meniscus tear. So I think you have to kind of understand that, like, look at what your patient needs and like use that as a justification. But the end thing is if they can lift heavy, let them lift heavy. Like what about in that period uh, right after they tear and then we're waiting for, you know, the two to three week period? Yeah. Uh, do you guys utilize BFR during that period also or, or not? I have, um, you know, the problem with a lot of that, it, it comes down to insurance coverage. So, but I have had a, a handful of kids that did about three to four weeks of preoperative rehab and man, we BFR them and they are flying. I mean, these kids came out of surgery, you know, no problems. They're just, they're doing great. So I think that could be another study that definitely needs to be looked at too. But, you know, the problem is you get a kid with a 20 visit max on their insurance. Like you can't burn those out in the beginning, um, you know, as much as it is important to get that in. So you know, like I said, everyone's kind of different, but I think there's some, some advantage to doing it early. Asking for a friend, how many times per week would you, would you do that in that period? Uh, twice a week, uh, for two to three weeks. Okay. And you know, you guys, you're probably familiar with the IPC. I think there's some value to the uh, ischemic preconditioning stuff that's going on mm -hmm. where you're putting it on hundred percent occlusion. Um, there's some studies that show that where you're basically just sitting there um, doing some stuff. But I think anytime you can do BFR with activity, it, you need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's, that's awesome. And then, uh, you know, how, 
how, how long have you been doing BFR, I guess? Give us kind of your background when, when you first started kind of getting introduced to that and stuff. Uh, I'm just curious. Yeah. No, good question. It was about, I think, seven, eight years ago. And uh, that was the first time I got introduced to Johnny. But prior to that, were we doing some of like the band raps and all that? You know, it had been around and people were talking about it. Uh, can I honestly say that I was doing the safest version? No, not at all, man. Yeah. I think we were dabbling and, and trying to figure it out, you know, blood pressure cuffs and all this stuff. And then, you know, I go down and I meet with Johnny uh, in Austin and, you know, he puts it on me and I'm doing squats in front of like a room of 10 people with my tights on, <laughs> you know, and I'm just killing me. I'm like, what is this thing? Uh, and at that point in time, I realized what it should feel like. Uh, and, and to know that like, that's really like, there's a, there's a difference in devices. There's a difference in like good quality devices and bad quality devices. And, and I think you got to, if you're going to do it and do it right, you know, spend the money and do it with the right cuff, um, that monitors the pressure the whole time. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a learning experience for sure. That, that is the nice thing with the Delphi. I mean, there's so much variability when it comes to exercise and when you start getting perfusion and, and to be able to have it automatically kind of go up and down regulation. I mean, you can feel it when you're exercising with it on. There's, there is a big difference. So uh, we, we use the Delphi here at Winchester Spine and Sport too. And uh, we've been doing some, some cool things with acute ankle sprains lately and, and things like that. And so uh, we, we absolutely love it. Our athletes, they love it, but they also hate it. So what's kind of the feedback that you get from, from, from yeah. your, your athletes? Yeah, you know that sound it makes when it comes on the ding, 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 like you hear that, man. And it's like a conditioned dog, right? They're like, yeah. so like, damn it, man, we're doing this again today. <laughs> uh, yeah, but here's the thing to get around that. What I found like measure, like show them the, show them the benefit, right? Like show them, hey, this is where you're at at week four. And now here we're at week eight and 10. Like look at your quad girth is like almost the same. You know, look at how well you're moving and go, you know, like all the suck was worth it. And then, I mean, I would tell these kids, like, if you want to get back to sport and you want to get back to sport safe, like right now this is your best option like i don't know anything else out there um because you're not going to heavily load these kids early on you just can't do it safely is um, your acl protocol different than the standard uh with bfr are you basically taking standard acl protocols and just integrating bfr in with that yeah we actually rewrote it this year uh, actually rewrote a whole new protocol with it and we combined some of the stuff with exos so some of like the med ball work and some of the pillar prep so we really kind of, I mean, I think it's one of the better protocols I've ever seen on ACL, uh, a little biased, of course, but it, it's well done. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it was a, it was a, it was a, a, a group effort, right? Like it wasn't just me. It was uh, most of my staff getting together. It was our excess performance coaches looking at it and, you know, filtering in where we could do some stuff. Um, one of the unique things that we do here is this kind of bridge program somewhere around three, four months, our kids go over to our performance staff and they start working out over there. Um, so they're doing two days a week in rehab, two to three days a week in performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Are we at, are we at the point now? And I, I know this is pure opinion because uh, the, the research is not out yet. But are we at the point now where BFR is standard of care with post ACL reconstruction? Uh, we're getting close. Yeah, I think we're getting close. I think to be at the the, the top level of this, like you should be doing some BFR with it. Uh, and that it's not just for ACL. I think you'll start to see it more with like UCLs and some of like your shoulder stuff too coming out where it's going to be, I mean, we've already got some stuff on the rotator cuffs, right? It's really nice for the rotator cuff because you don't want to overload that, that tendon, but you can do some nice work with it and hopefully heal that up a little bit. It's interesting. You get, we've gotten some resistance from the orthopedic surgeons around St. Louis. I'm curious cause you're with, uh, literally the best one. What would, what's James Andrews take on BFR? Yeah, so I didn't know this until we did the uh, the journal club Thursday night. But Johnny was saying, you know, Doc's kind of got this um, four week. He doesn't want to do it for some kind of a, a reason. I, I don't quite understand. And I have to reach out to him. Um, he probably didn't know we were doing it when I was there. <laughs> so <laughs> and he's, oh, you guys are great. I don't know what's going on. But I think now that he's kind of aware of it and it's there, you know, he, he's a little hesitant. And I think you're going to see that with your your older guys, right? They're kind of, well, like, what is this technology, right? We talk about like dry needling. These guys freak out. Like, what are you doing putting needles on my patient? Um, same thing with BFR, but some of the younger guys, you know, you explain the physiology and they're like, oh no, that makes sense. Right. Like that, I can see how that can work. And then they see the results and they're like, oh, that's pretty cool. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, is the Owens group, what you suggest for, for people as far as if they want to learn more about BFR and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. I think for them, they're the most you know, they have the most research evidence based if you want to know everything about it. And the guys that teach it are just super cool, man. Um, and, and they're accessible. So if you have a question, like you can email or text any of those guys that run those courses and they'll get back to you that day, uh, which I don't know many people. Um, 
you know, I saw a, a little thing last week. Somebody did a little, uh, I'm not going to say any names, but somebody did a little BFR deal and said, you know, you don't need the certification and you don't need this. And then they were like, but we're selling a certification package. I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> like, you know, no, you don't need a $5,000 unit. You can get this, you know, $150 unit. And I'm like, no, man, like, let, let's not preach that crap. Like, let's, let's get the right stuff out there. And I know not everybody can afford a $5,000 unit. Um, I think there's some other alternatives that can probably work pretty well, but you know, if you want to be safe, oh, I lost my lighting. If you want to be safe with your patients, I think you got to pick that. So just, and just for the record, none of us are getting paid by the owner's recovery group. That's, no. We just yeah, can't even get a device and, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah. What do you think about a, a lot of people you know? are drawing comparisons, obviously with the ACL and then the UCL um, and the elbow. So we have the whole Tommy John, you know, problem right now or epidemic problem. So I know you're starting to integrate that in with those athletes. And what are your thoughts on the future for uh, blood flow restriction with UCL repair? Yeah. I mean, one of the things I'd like to see, and I think a really basic study, like diagnostic ultrasound of that UCL initially, once they get hurt and then maybe do like a six to eight week trial. Um, I kind of mentioned it with some of the guys from the Astros and, you know, we did a talk about it a year ago, never, nothing really came out of it, but I think there's some, if you think about like connective tissue is connective tissue. So if, we know what BFR does to connective tissue. Like it makes sense that that would help with the UCL. You know, we can work on the other areas of the body, uh, you know, through like some of like the DNS techniques and some stuff where we're working on, you know, rotational stability and core work. Because at the end of the day, I don't think it's the elbow that's the problem on a lot of these kids, right? I think, you know, a lot of it's just not being able to link those kinetic chains and, and get everything working together, especially the 12 and 13 year old athlete who's grown six inches and doesn't know how to use their body. And these are the kids that are playing baseball six days a week. So, you know, it's safe in that population. We can do it. I've been doing it for three years, four years now, and getting some pretty good results with it, where we're not having to do surgical stuff with these kiddos and trying to keep them out of that surgical mindset. Um, but I think it works. I think it helps quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Which kind of takes us to our, our next subtle plug. So uh, in November, we're actually going to be uh, in your hood. We'll be uh, basically where you're at right now, where your work is with, for DNS Baseball One. And so, um, you know, I've kind of been chopping at the bit a little bit of maybe entertaining, throwing on a couple BFR cuffs uh, in some DNS positions while we're there. And uh, maybe yeah. maybe just mess around with some things uh, while, while we got the got a nearby. But uh, sure. DNS Baseball, it's, it's the second course you've ever taught of it third third third, third official third dns baseball course november 5th through the 7th uh we're hyped to be down there in texas uh in november when it's probably gonna be cold here in st louis so um your facility is is amazing so uh you you host courses all the time but uh we're really excited to partner with you for that so i think this facility even if uh even if you don't like dns baseball it's worth coming down to see what <laughs> steven's got going on steve and i became fast friends years ago just when we randomly he attended a dns course and uh he was of course a, a star pupil in there and then uh, i think steven's really good at integrating and not talking you know he's uh you know willing to just you know put his neck out and and plug it in so uh, i think that would just be an amazing experience for for that course for sure absolutely absolutely yeah, and then yeah so steven you you sent us some bfr for the upper extremity that we wanted to uh I'm going to share my screen here and uh, I just kind of want you to talk about what's going on here and kind of how you're integrating this. Yeah. So just a simple little bicep curl uh, with the BFR. Um, we're very lucky to have like the Kaiser uh, resistance. So uh, that's that pneumatic stuff. It's really awesome because the resistance doesn't change, but it's a whole nother world. Like if you do that versus like a band, uh, it's, it's a different feel. It's a different, uh, kind of mentality, but, uh, it, it'll burn you out. Um, little tricep extension there with the BFR and remember our reps and sets, right? 30, 15, 15, 15 with a 30 second rest break in between. Mm -hmm. Uh, the goal of this, and I think one of the things we fail in BFR, like we got to take these guys to failure. Uh, that last set of 15 should be pretty difficult. Um, they shouldn't be smiling or texting on their phone while they're doing that stuff. Right. Uh, you guys have used it. You know, it's, it's crazy. Um, uh, you know, front raises, side raises, you, you can really get creative there. There's really just kind of whatever you want to do. The only thing is don't run the same muscle group back to back. Right. So mm -hmm. if I'm going to do like a pull, like I don't want to do another pull right immediately after that. Like I want to go do something else, whether it's a push or sometimes something else that's not directed at that muscle. 
because it does fatigue the muscle out pretty good, right? We're taking it to failure. So we don't want to keep pounding that thing down. Single arm row right here. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And, and that's the nice thing with BFR too, is like we, we were kind of talking about, you can, I mean, the world is your oyster. You can do yeah. basically whatever you want. I mean, I, I can't tell you, uh, you know, that it's up to your imagination. You can add in regular strength exercises. You're just doing them at a lighter load, but you're getting the same amount of quality, the same amount of, uh, you know, uh, fatigue, all that stuff with a higher rep, higher, uh, higher weight. I mean, I've done body blade stuff. Um, I'm sure you guys have, have tried it, but the push-up challenge, I don't know if you guys did that when you did the courses, but uh, it's pretty hard to do a, a 75 push-ups with BFR on. Yeah, it's insane. It's insane, so. What do you think about BFR in the healthy athlete? Like, no complaint, no post-surgery. Like, is there utilization for that? Yeah, so um, – You'll, if you look at like MLB and some of the other like NBA, I think is doing a little bit of it. And even the NFL, uh, almost like a periodization kind of mindset where if you're going to lift heavy one week and then maybe the second week, you're going to do a little more BFR. Um, you know, and it depends on what part of the season you're in. So, you know, if you're in season, like, yeah, BFR has got some great usage. Like you've got your pitcher that's pitched, you know, a couple of games and then, you know, he's got three, four days off. Like let's do some BFR stuff. I mean, especially if you got anybody with any kind of crazy little pain stuff that's going on, like, you know, the analgesic effects with BFR are really nice. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think there's some, a ton of things. And then like the IPC stuff, like, you know, that's being used a lot more widely now um, where they've got the hundred percent occlusion for like five minutes and they're running like four cycles of that. Uh, it's pretty passive, but you know, the end of the day, we're getting metabolites into that, into the system. So, you know, why not? Right. Um, yeah. I think there's usage even in a healthy. Now, if, if, I don't, the studies that have come out on like high load resistance training with BFR, they're not, they're not showing much compared to like just lifting heavy. Mm -hmm. Like if you can lift heavy, lift heavy. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's all what you're into. And are insurance companies entertaining reimbursement for this, or you're just kind of playing the game and just kind of building it in or baking into the cake? Yeah. So they don't have like a diagnostic code or like any kind of a billing code for BFR directly. I think like the last time I know in therapy, like the last code that was entered was like 1989. So like we haven't had a new code in like 20 something years. So that I think we've tried to do it, but we just bill it as a you know, standard Therax. We just throw a, a blood pressure cup on there or the, uh, the, the, you know, Owens cups on there. Right. Yeah. 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 Yep. I love it. Awesome. Well, uh, Steven, thank you so much for sitting yeah. down with us and talking about blood flow restriction with the post ACL and then, uh, entertaining a little bit of the possibilities for the upper extremity athlete as well. So, oh, yeah. um, again, I just want to say, uh, we hope to see you all at, at, uh, the Andrews Institute in Texas, uh, come November. So, uh, all that information is on our website, gustaliu.com and, uh, Steven, any last thoughts or any, any last things? No, I appreciate you guys having me on today, man. I always love talking about this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. All right, man. Well, we can't wait to see you in the future and uh, you have a great rest of your day. Right, Keep crushing patience, man. Bye, Steve. Y'all right, take it easy, man. All right, guys. So uh, thanks for tuning in to our, our uh, podcast with Stephen LaPlante. So uh, Brett and I, we're just going to start doing some recaps or some some debriefs after these where, um, you know, BFR isn't 100%. We don't do it every single patient. And so, it, but it still has a, a, a really uh, big application and, and things that we think can really kind of up level your rehab. So um, he kind of presented on the post-surgical ACL. For us chiropractors, that maybe isn't as applicable. However, you know, I, we, all the time we see maybe some rehab that doesn't go right or, um, you know, kids that come back too early that get these re-tears or these tweaks and stuff like that. And so that's, I think, where we can come in and utilize VFR and our other knowledge to really have an impact on these kids yeah i agree it's it sounds like you know after talking to steven and others too this isn't a get rich scheme by any means so it's no. not about like you're going to be billing out that much more money it's just about it's just one more thing to probably enhance your results and i mean the question we always have is you know does this have a place in a chiropractic office and i think we're seeing that it does <laughs> if you're you know practicing in isolation you don't have help around you it might be a little bit more challenging mm -hmm. however a lot of people who are in group practice and they have ca I think this is definitely it, it to me it's just it's not rocket science you mm -hmm. just you know it's kind of plug and play exactly exactly and I mean we we've entertained the idea of maybe trying cheaper models or doing other things but I, I really do think that 
the Delphi machine, even though it's got a hefty price tag, I mean, it is integrative and it is, uh, I mean, it's amazing. So um, it's the only one that has an internal Doppler that basically is uh, changing its pressure based on what the what the patient's doing. And so, uh, but yeah, I think you're 100% right, Brett. Like it, it just takes time, takes time to set up, takes time to do the exercises. Uh, and so uh, doing it alone, yeah, it could be a little bit trickier. So if you have the patient visit time, then yeah, absolutely. But um, and, and I mean, there's lots of different options too for getting paid for this i think you know you could you could do it as a cash service you could uh just say nope i'm just going to integrate it in with my therax uh, there, there's lots of different ways to go about it so sounds like we got a gaping hole in the upper extremity i.e the uh tommy john surgery so that uh after talking to steven i think he, he's definitely got his brain going there so that would i think that's exciting yeah absolutely world. especially for those um those non-operative uh you know patients that you know, maybe you get three weeks to make a change before they're going to surgery. This would be another add-on to kind of literally throw the kitchen sink at them to see if you can make a change. Uh, and, and especially if now diagnostic ultrasound is becoming more and more integrated into Cairo's offices and stuff like that. I mean, like he was saying, if you could diagnostic image pre and post, that could lead you to, to do some things differently or to make sure you're making changes. I think too, it's so fascinating to see the continuum of anything, but I think those of you who are in their forties right now, if you watch WWF when you're uh, younger, Randy Macho Man Savage, when he would tie off his bicep and then even like in the bodybuilding culture, BFR has literally been around since the 1970s and uh, obviously being utilized for muscle hypertrophy. And, uh, and I mean, that's one of the things they're seeing now that I think is just a huge standout. I'll speak from experience. Once you have a knee surgery, your quadricep basically is, I mean, it is halved in a day. I mean, there is just, your quadricep basically just wilts away. So being able to maintain that quadricep girth after your surgery is just, I think it's critical mm -hmm. as far as uh, one of the big benefits to to BFR amongst amongst many others. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I, I've been really tuned into is uh, the Owens Group does have a, a really good podcast where they present on their research. Uh, so they, uh, they actually do a great job of donating their machines to these different research groups and so that's the other nice thing is like if you're using their machine the research is done on the machine you know that the results are probably going to be pretty similar or even better if you're using you know uh, maybe better strategies or, or better implementation and so um, check out their stuff uh, I can't remember what their podcast is called but if you just look up the Owens recovery group that it'll, it'll be on there but um, I'm excited for the uh, DNS baseball uh, to you know maybe start talking to him I'm sure we'll have a, a wine conversation with him about you know the possibilities of the UCL and, and upper extremity cuffs so um, you've been around it at the stadium Brett that's kind of where you got your first stop or first introduction into that where did you have any application for those or was it still kind of new at that point I think at that point it was still pretty new and people were just kind of like you know uh, playing around mm -hmm. you know but now I think you know as time's gone on the protocols have kind of uh, been shored up a little bit I mean and where my mind immediately goes is how to incorporate BFR with DNS like mm -hmm. that's just like because, I mean, to me, you're getting the best of all worlds. So uh, you can be more specific with, you know, having a more synergistic muscle contraction with DNS. But then on top of, <clears throat> excuse me, on top of that, then you're also including the blood flow to these muscles. So you're almost like doubling down in mm -hmm. a way. And I think, I mean, that I think between you and me, that that's where we're going. Mm -hmm. Definitely here and in that integration. And then, uh, yeah, it's just w literally mm -hmm. one more tool in the toolbox. You can't probably use it in isolation, but used with other things. It's, uh, Pretty it's fun. amazing. And that's basically the gestalt education model. So that's right. Absolutely. So it has a place. I think absolutely. that's what we're learning. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 100% has a place. So um, coming up, I'm sure we, we've been doing some cool stuff with acute ankle sprain so, uh, and BFR. So we'll, we'll more than likely do a podcast on that in the next, I don't know, a couple weeks or something along those lines. But uh, anyway, uh, Steven, what a killer. Yep, man. So, he is he is awesome. Uh, so anyway, we hope to see you guys at DNS Baseball. It's uh, the first weekend in November, November 5th through the 7th. Uh, it's a really, really cool facility. Even just to come check that out, especially uh, maybe from group practice for a little inspiration of, of how things can kind of be integrated together and uh, that kind of stuff. So anyway, anything to, to add, be done? No, just DNS Baseball. I've worked hard to get it to where it is. It's basically, you know, everything – 
that somebody who knows DNS as they're looking at the baseball athlete would be looking at or looking for. And I just feel like of all the sports, baseball is one of the best ones. And it, I, I do believe one of the answers to the, the UCL epidemic is within the parameters of, of an analysis of DNS. So it's, yeah, I just think it's, uh, it's exciting. It's very exciting. Rock so, and roll. Yep. All right, guys. Well, uh, have a good day. Uh, good luck with patience this week. And as always, uh, give us some feedback. Uh, if you like what we're doing, give us a five-star rate, rating on uh, whatever podcast platform you're doing. If you got any suggestions for guests or topics or anything like that, let us know. Uh, but have a good day.